What are we gonna tell our children? What are we gonna tell our children? What are we gonna tell our children? Say no to war. Say no to war. Say no to war. Let's protect this earth. It's our only salvation. Let's think of tomorrow, future generations. Not just ours, but all of creations. It's time to reveal what is real. It's time, time to heal. I uh, introduce to you, uh, without you and without our executive director, the Reverend Robert Moore, all of this work would not get itself done. So I want to introduce and thank Bob for helping us coordinate and organize today. Um, we're here today, as Charlene already reminded us to say no to war. Say no to war. Uh, you know, there is an allegation of chemical weapons use in Syria, and I want to underline that word allegation. It's an allegation right now. United Nations inspectors have been there. We're still waiting for their report. But we had allegations made before the Iraq war. Do you remember that? Yeah. And that, was a, that turned out to be a war of mass deception, didn't it? Yeah. We've got a question authority. Yes. They told us that military force in Iraq was going to be a cakewalk. Remember that? Yes. Remember mission accomplished? And that was all an illusion. It was a long nine-year war. There is no such thing as a surgical strike. That is an oxymoron. <laughs> We're here to say no to war and no to bombing in Syria. Now, uh... I've devoted my entire adult life to working against weapons of mass destruction, especially nuclear weapons. Now, chemical weapons are usually included in that category. I think they're actually slightly different. They don't kill, frankly, as massively. It's a horrible killing weapon, but it doesn't kill as massively as a nuclear weapon. Nonetheless, it's horrible. And one thing we want to make clear is that there is a false dichotomy being presented to the American people, this is part of the deception, that when an evil like that is perpetrated, that our choices are either to do nothing or to go in and bomb. I reject that as a false dichotomy and a false choice. We have a lot of other choices. The first thing we need to do is find out what the facts are. The UN is in the process of that, and now even France, who has been our strongest ally in this campaign for bombing, even the French president said yesterday, nothing should happen until we hear the UN inspector's report, and that makes a whole lot of sense. Mr. President Obama, stop your rush to war! Fact-finding is the first thing. Secondly, diplomacy. Now, a promising start was made by the Obama administration, Secretary Kerry in particular. He went to Russia and he got their consent that together they would host an international peace conference with all the parties in Syria. You know what? There is no military solution to the crisis in Syria. It's a horrible, messy civil war with a lot of different parties involved, including Al-Qaeda. The only way that we can get things under control and get to a peaceful solution is through diplomacy. We're here to say diplomacy, not war. And finally, there is such a thing as international law. You see that on your posters. You know, one of the things that I think has been most heartening to me that is the best accomplishment since the founding of the United Nations, in my opinion, in terms of moving us toward a more orderly international order, a peaceful one, was the founding of the International Criminal Court. That is founded so that people who commit crimes against humanity and the use of chemical weapons is one of those. People who do such horrendous acts 
can be captured and brought to justice. And that is starting to happen. That's the good news. People who committed war crimes against Bosnia are being captured and they're being brought to justice and they're being sentenced and they are in jail right now. That's another alternative, isn't it? Well, you got to watch out. I'm a preacher, so I'm watching my watch here. I think I've only gone about seven minutes so far. So I'm way below my 20-minute sermon, but I want to call on a colleague in the clergy at this point to give us a little bit more substance on why this proposed bombing does not meet the just war criteria. And he's also been on our board. He's a longtime leader and friend for peace and uh, a leader in the Coalition for Peace Action. Professor George Hunsinger of Princeton Theological Seminary. Please give a welcome to George. Thank you very much, Bob. I come here today with a heavy heart. I think back to the first anti-war rally that I ever took part in, almost 50 years ago, in 1966. I was still a college student. I didn't know whether I was against the Vietnam War or not, but I knew I was against the bombing of civilians. I knew that the bombing of civilians was a war crime. So I happened to be at the Los Angeles Coliseum uh, fortuitously on a, on a date when there was a, a silent protest uh, organized by the Quakers. You can always count on the Quakers. Amen. And there were some signs sitting on the ground and one of them said, stop the bombing. So I picked up one of those placards I did not know at the time that I was embarking upon a lifelong series of anti-war activities and actions. I did not know that I would later become a part of the Riverside Church Disarmament Program under William Sloan Coffin, where we opposed the Reagan nuclear buildup yep. of first strike nuclear weapons. I did not know that there would be wars in Central America and that many years of my life would be taken up in work with solidarity with the people of El Salvador. And in those days, we used to say El Salvador is Spanish for Vietnam. I did not know that there would be other wars coming along, including uh, the first Gulf War, including the war on Afghanistan, uh, including the war in Iraq, which I joined forces with Bob and the Coalition for Peace Action, and we worked against that war right. uh, from the very beginning, from Amen. before it started Amen. Uh, until it, it came to an official end, although uh, conflict goes on. But I have to say to you that I believe this war is the most dangerous and potentially catastrophic war that I have seen in my lifetime. It has not yet been 100 years since August 1914. And we all know how inadvertently that terrible catastrophe was triggered. There are untold numbers of tripwires in the Middle East. There are at least six major nations with an interest in that conflict. This war will do nothing to bring about a long-term and reasonable settlement. It will only run the risk of World War III. There could be a false flag attack, for example, on a U.S. ship in the Mediterranean, which would draw the U.S. even further uh, into the Syrian conflict. Bob is right. There's no such thing as a surgical strike. It makes no sense to bomb civilians in order to protest uh, the gassing and the bombing, uh, the killing of civilians. Uh, that is not uh, the solution. Right. And the risks are not worth taking. There's no reasonable chance of success. 
this will make it almost impossible to bring about what is needed, and that is a ceasefire Amen. and a political settlement Amen. to the conflict in Syria. That's if right. you are concerned about humanitarian intervention, yep. the most credible form of humanitarian intervention is not cruise missile strikes on Damascus and Syria. The most credible form of humanitarian intervention would be ending the war. Amen. Yes. End the war crimes yes. by ending the war. Yes. yes, war crimes have been committed on both sides. Terrible war crimes all around. Civilians have been targeted. There are uh, nearly uh, a million or so refugees from this conflict. This is a terrible conflict that is tearing the country of Syria apart. And if those rebels, which include al-Qaeda forces, get a hold of Syria's yeah. chemical weapons, That's right. then we're going to see real crimes against That's right. uh, humanity. Amen. There have been threats from Iran that if this yep. conflict yep. is unleashed, Iran will attack Israel. Yes. If you love Israel and want the survival of Israel, you must oppose this war. That's right. Other observers believe that uh, an attack on Saudi Arabia is more likely mm -hmm. from Iran or, or who knows what. But the point is, it's going to be very hard to keep this conflict contained. There are just war criteria that, that Bob mentioned. I've written about You can see my full analysis on the coalition website. He's but coalition. I'm talking here today about the criterion of reasonable chance of success. Mm -hmm. This intervention has no reasonable chance of success, That's and right. it has untold potential for disaster, a worse disaster than August 1914. We are on the brink of World War III. So it is completely immoral and completely irresponsible for the United States to launch this attack. And people say, where is the peace movement? Well, let me tell you something. The peace movement has been around working tirelessly for the last 50 years. And now a majority of the American people is against this war. That's right. This did not happen in a vacuum. You know, it's, it's small gatherings like this one that have made a long-term difference to the point that, let's hope, Obama's hands may be tied. The people do not want it, and the military does not yes, want it. Yes, yes, that's right. Martin uh, Dempsey, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has gone about as far as he can to speak out publicly against the United States entering into this war. The military is tired of costly and futile military interventions. They don't want it. The people don't want it. Why does Obama want it? it we have to do what we can. And fortunately, we have a great representative in the House here, uh, Rush Holt, uh, who will listen to us. But what about Senator Menendez? I, I at least can never vote for him again. He is the chair of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he has voted for this terrible authorization of military forces, which give Obama a carte blanche to, in, to initiate and to widen that war with no constraints whatsoever. I, I want to close by reading just a few lines from Hans Blix. Hans Blix is a Swedish mm. diplomat who led the uh, UN investigation into yep. whether uh, uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Yep. Uh, he was not listened to. He right. was ridiculed at the time. The, the coalition brought him here, yes. here a few years ago mm -hmm. to speak at one of our events. You know, Hans Blix has a, a lot of wisdom and has proven to be correct. Uh, the the uh, Irrefutable evidence, so-called, that uh, Colin Powell presented to the uh, United Nations on February the 5th, 2003, turned out to be almost totally false. That's right. And the same is true with the evidence that is being promulgated on the American people today. It is almost totally false. It, it's, it's a propaganda effort. You mark my words. You may think I'm wrong. Pay attention. 
People didn't believe me when I said this yep. in January of 2003, and many will not believe me today. Just keep your eyes open and pay attention. I believe that uh, history will absolve us when we say that this is another dodgy dossier. Right. That's right. So Hans Blix uh, has written an article uh, opposing military intervention and outlining the steps for a reasonable solution to the conflict that I believe anyone who cares about humanitarian intervention would be compelled to uh, support. He wrote, with 100,000 killed and millions of refugees, the Syrian civil war itself is a moral obscenity. The Security Council must seek to achieve not just an end to chemical weapons use, but an end to all weapons use by a ceasefire, as was planned not long ago by the United States and Russia. The Security Council must seek to bring about a conference at which relevant parties and states can form an interim authority. The alternative is continued civil war in Syria and worsening international relations. Is ending, the ending of active hostilities totally unrealistic? He asked. That's what many people would say. Let us be clear that the government in Syria, like its rebel opponents, depends on a flow of weapons right. and munitions and money from the outside. It is reported that much of the rebels' material support comes from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey. And much of the government's support reportedly comes from Russia and Iran. He's diplomatically silent about the United States in this statement. These supplier countries have leverage. Agreement should be sought under the auspices of the UN Security Council. And by the way, by threatening to go to war without Security Council approval, it's not only Syria and Damascus that are in the crosshairs, the Security Council is in the crosshairs. International law is in the crosshairs. If the United States undertakes this unilateral intervention without the support of Congress, without the support of the Security Council, without the support yeah. of NATO, without the support of That's the right. Organization of Arab States, and so on. All parties giving such support to, to those involved in the conflict must be pressured so that the, their clients accept a ceasefire or risk losing any further support. The only viable solution to the crisis is political. Yes. Far-reaching concessions will be required from all parties. The overriding priority is to revitalize the search for a political settlement. A unilateral U.S. attack would not serve to advance that goal, but to postpone or demolish it. The war on and in Syria could stop within a few weeks if the United States and its allies would stop delivering weapons, ammunition, and other support to the insurgency, yes. and would serious, seriously seek a negotiated Amen. solution. Amen. Thank Amen. you. All right. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. And uh, while uh, I'd like to call on Father Vince Gartland in a minute, and while he's coming up, uh, Father Vince, start coming forward. I just want to acknowledge a few people. Uh, you know, uh, Irene already gave me some recognition and credit, but this is a real team effort. Uh, and my interns, Laura and Matt, Matt's out there somewhere. Raise your hand, Matt. And there's Laura. Raise your hand. Uh, they're from Princeton Seminary, same place as George as a professor. And also my beautiful wife, Mary. I want to give an acknowledgement to her. She's been an anchor in my life, a great, the love of my life, a great asset. So uh, I just want to do those few acknowledgements. Father Vince is going to be doing an interfaith prayer uh, event tonight he wants to tell you about. And, uh, you know, I encourage you to come if you can. Uh, it's part of responding to a call by Pope Francis. So, Father Vince, come forward. I, I, I come today simply to, to add my voice to, to your voices and my prayers and support to, to you. I think it's, it's so important that we do this, that we gather together as people and 
Pope Francis has called on people of every religion and no religion to gather today in some way and to raise our voices and our hearts. Uh, it's interesting that as we gather here in Palmer Square today, uh, thousands of people are beginning to gather in St. Peter's Square yes. for a five-hour vigil that will begin in just about an hour. And people are gathering all over the world. Yes. In cities and yes. in small places. And that gathering is what we need. We need to, to kind of gather support from one another. Violence has never, ever brought peace in any way. Amen. We know that. Amen. And so we need to work for negotiations. We need to work for talking together. We need to work to bring people together. And we all know that. But our voices can be helpful. Our presence can be helpful. We can really support one another. So I do encourage you to come this evening uh, 7 to 8 down at St. St. Anne's Church, which is right down the road, right down Route 206, uh, right past Ryder University, across from Dunkin' Donut or the... Uh, the firehouse there and we'll gather for some song we'll gather for some quiet time we'll gather for some prayer uh, as sisters and brothers people that belong to this one human race that we all belong to that we love we're trying to preserve in every way we can and so uh, that's that's so important for Amen. us to be here thank Amen. you thank you very much. Thanks, so thank you, Father Vince. Really appreciate that. I, you know, I agreed 99.9% .9 with what George had said just a few minutes ago. Here's my one little quibble. He said it's small gatherings. We are over 150 people here right now, and I don't call that small for a town like Princeton. We are the majority. Over 60% of Americans are against this bombing, and you know what? The arguments that are being made by high administration officials and others aren't changing anybody's mind. It doesn't make sense. We need to say no to bombing in Syria. Our next speaker, and Jeff, if you could start coming toward the front. I know you're out there somewhere. Here he comes. Uh, Jeff Laurenti. He was long the head of policy studies at the United Nations Association of the United States. He is currently the president of the board of the Princeton Trenton area chapter of the association. He wanted me to mention in bringing him forward that Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has publicly reiterated that the use of armed force is only lawful, only lawful with Security Council authorization or self-defense. U.S. Ambassador Samantha Power has said there is no viable path forward in the Security Council, but the United States will, and that the United States will just have to act on its own. I think Jeff is going to tell us why that doesn't hold up to scrutiny. So, Jeff Lorente, please come forward. All right. Thank Good you, Italian Bob. greeting. Good Italian <laughs> greeting. Uh, good afternoon, fellow New Jerseyans. Good afternoon, fellow citizens of the United States and of the world. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to give quite as rip-roaring and stem-winding an address <laughs> as Bob Moore has already done to highlight the, what lies ahead of us. And I think, first, we want to credit President Obama for over five years having resisted the steady drumbeat of the usual circles in Washington for aggressive U.S. military action. And for five years, for five years having toiled, for five years having toiled to resuscitate the American commitment to international law and specifically to the United Nations framework for regulating use of force and for securing international peace. He knows that the unilateral use of force is a recipe for failure, whether it was the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, whether it was the United States in southern Vietnam, uh, or whether it was the United States in Iraq. And the current predicament, it must be acknowledged, 
derives not from any neo-imperial fantasies of a new American century that may have motivated other national decision makers in the not so distant past, but rather from the shock and horror, not just of President Obama, not just of his team, but of most of the civilized world and even the uncivilized world at the glaring breach by someone in Syria's bitter civil war, most likely a long embattled government, uh, of one of the most basic taboos that grew out of the horrific wars of the last century, the ban on the use of chemical weapons. Now, the U.S. has carefully played by the U.N. Charter rules of the game in many cases since the end of the Cold War on use of force. The elder President Bush had sought UN Security Council approval, thought to have been impossible, for intervention to oust Iraqi occupiers from Kuwait. Uh, President Clinton adhered to and had UN Security Council authorization uh, for use of force approved by the UN in, the, in Bosnia and in Haiti. Uh, President Obama has sought and gotten UN Security Council authorization for strictly limited uses of force in Libya, where perhaps the envelope was pushed a little too far, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and in Mali. But we are told now, ah, but the counterexample is Kosovo. Uh, and mm. you have a celebration in Washington of Kosovo, the Kosovo War against Serbia, having been, in that view, successful. Well, that Kosovo war, we shouldn't forget, also led to the installation of Vladimir Putin in Russia, mm -hmm. uh, the head of the KGB being made head of the government because of Russia's humiliation there. And that Kosovo war begat President Bush's Iraq war. So thinking of the Kosovo exception invites a wide range of potential abuses, and we shouldn't forget that looking ahead 20, 30 years, there will be other superpowers capable of following the same. Make up your own rules at your own time if you're not careful. Can the U.S. not seek a vote in the Security Council if Amen. it believes that it has this broad international support? That's right. Maybe not get Russian support. Get your nine votes. Show that you have a critical mass of international support. Then go to the General Assembly. If this yes. is, yes. as has been said, a question of American readiness to, to put force behind the international community's basic norm, you should have the international community behind you. Even better, can the United States and Russia and the other members of the Security Council now uh, not agree to submit to the International Criminal Court the yes. case for on chemical weapons use exactly. in Syria by any party. Yes. And that, I would submit, would be more of a deterrent yes. Yes. for the Syrian officials That's right. or the other side, whoever may have gotten his hands on chemical weapons, from daring to use them That's again right. and require in that resolution the Syrian government and in rebel-held areas the rebels to give unfettered access to the UN investigators and to the ICC prosecutors. This would be far more yes. convincing. Amen. And far more enduring and a far yes. more fundamental cornerstone of international law and practice for the rest of this century than reverting to that tested, tried and true and usually failed device of a quick bombing that turns out not to be so quick. In conclusion, by remarks, this is the time for the United States, for all the members of the Security Council to insist on an immediate ceasefire in the Syrian civil war, to insist on immediately convening yes. the peace conference that yes. Secretary Lavrov, uh, Kerry yes. and Foreign Minister Lavrov have been working with UN envoy Lakhdar Brahimi at a desultory pace so far right. to convene, to hammer out a political settlement between the government and the Syrian, not foreign fighter, Syrian opposition, backed by all relevant countries in the international Amen. community. When we can't even get half of the members of the G20 right, right. to put their names on a statement 
calling for enforcement, uh, then it's a sign that we may not have enough of the international backing. And the worst thing that we would have for our, since this word is often used in Washington, credibility, uh, would be for once again the United States to find itself as a lone ranger and find itself as viewed as the bad guy by much of the world rather than what we know historically we can and should and usually have been the good guys. So I hope that you will join me in pressing for us once again to affirm ourselves as the good guys devoted to international law, international Amen. peace and security. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. He's getting, giving the good Italian greeting to Irene here with the kiss on both cheeks. I didn't get the kiss on both cheeks, so see, I need more of an Arab greeting here. Uh, all right, assalam, that's right. Um, so uh, just to add one quick thing to what Jeff said, when you got here, I hope you got one of these flyers. If not, I know Matt and others. Yeah, they're holding them up. Uh, there is an excellent piece from a few days ago in the New York Times uh, by uh, two scholars from Tufts University, and it really goes much further in debunking what Jeff was talking about, about Kosovo as some kind of precedent for this. It just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Really what solved Kosovo was an international peace conference in the, in the Dayton Accords, and that required a diplomatic surge more than anything. That's what we need, diplomacy, not war. It's now my great honor to uh, introduce somebody who was born in Syria, has deep roots there, and is a prominent religious leader from Syria. And uh, I haven't asked him if I have, am pronouncing his name correctly here, but uh, Archbishop, that part I know. Uh, more Cyril Afrim Karim. Did I well get done. it about right? Well done. All right, Archbishop Karim, please welcome him, and let's hear his good words. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for coming out, all of you, to speak against war in Syria in my hometown and in the hometown of the most ancient religious Christian religious community in the world, the Aramaic-speaking Christians of Syria. Mm -hmm. And in the hometown, the, the country of many millions of peace-loving Christians and Muslims living yes. together for many centuries Amen. peacefully. Amen. And only the last two and a half years, Christians have been targeted, not by the Syrians, but mostly by the former fighters who come and do jihad in Syria. They want to bring us an Islamic mm -hmm. regime in Syria, mm -hmm. a Sharia a law to be implemented, and Christians to be tr thrown out or convert. I come to you today to thank you, but also to ask you to pray yes. for Syria and for the United States of America. This war will not help. Syria and will neither help the United States of America. Right. It's against the interests of this great country. I was born in Syria and I grew up in Syria and then later I came here to serve our people who are of Syrian descent and of Middle Eastern descent in general. I came here in 1996 and since then I enjoyed the great opportunities, the great freedoms, the great possibilities of this, this country affords and offers to all the people of the world. The United States of America is destination number one for every single citizen of the, of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. They all look up to the United States of America, not because of the powerful and mighty military of the United States of America, but because of what the United States of America stands for in That's terms right. of human rights, yes. justice to yes. all, and in terms of leadership. Yes. Leadership. Leadership is not about power. It's Amen. not about killing people. It's That's not about right. showing how, how mighty we are. It's about leading the world in morals and in peace. That's right. And this is what we want the United States of America to do today. The United States of America has to play the big brother role to bring people together, the people of Syria, those who are fighting the opposition, those who are fighting for freedoms have right to fight for that but in peaceful ways not through carrying arms yes i come here 
because I believe in peace and because I believe you believe in peace. Yes. We, all of us, follow the Prince yes. of Peace. Amen. And the Prince of Peace calls us blessed if we are peacemakers. That's right. So please keep that in mind. Christians in Syria are going to be hurt even more if the United States carries out this attack. In many ways, they are going to be hurt, but the most horrif horrific way would be by forcing them to leave Syria. Mm. You know what happens if this regime, the Assad regime, topples? I'm not here to defend the regime. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to defend the regime. Right. The regime had made many mistakes, yep. but the, the, the way to reform and to change is not through war. That's right. Christians, if this regime falls, and given that we do not have, in the United States of America, we do not have a next day scenario, we do not have a next day plan, we do not know who is going to retaliate, Syria, Iran, others, mm -hmm. and all of them are threatening that they are going to retaliate. Yeah. Even if one missile falls on Syria, they will hit. They will the American interest, they will hit also America's friends' interest. Therefore, if this regime falls, most probably, and that's our worst scenario that we are expecting, or our fear that an Islamic regime will take over. What we have seen for the last two and a half years that is not a good indication of what's to come. Let me share a couple of things with you. Yesterday, an ancient town called Ma'lula, which, which is just outside the skirts of Damascus, northeast of Damascus, a town which has almost 90% Christian population, a town which speaks, speaks Aramaic, a, a dialect that our Lord Jesus spoke. You remember the, the movie, the, the, Jesus, the Passion of the Christ? That dialect of Aramaic is still spoken in Ma'lula. A town that has been has kept itself out of this conflict for so far was attacked yesterday right, by religious fanatics from outside Syria, with some locals, of course, with them. But it was attacked by people from Chechnya, from Uzbekistan, from all these Caucasus countries, from Saudi Arabia, from Kuwait, from Qatar, from Turkey. These are allies of the United States of America. Their governments are. This town was attacked, churches were destroyed, monasteries were violated, and people were killed. Why? Because they are not rising against the regime. Christians are not the only people who are not rising against the regime. There are many Muslims also, because they see this war as a destruction of the country, and they do not want that. M most of them may not be in favor of the regime, but they do not see change coming through destroying the country. You do not need yeah. to destroy a country to bring change. Right. You do not need that. Diplomacy Amen. works. Amen. If indeed, if indeed the Assad regime is proven to have carried out these chemical attacks, proven by the United, by the United Nations and right. by other independent agencies, right. Right. then there should be some international law to be followed. Right. America should not go after every single leader in the world to punish him. Mm. That's not the duty of our country here. We That's should right. offer leadership in other ways. Amen. And no wonder, no wonder that the international community is not with us on this. No wonder that you, the U.S. population is divided and majority of the U.S. citizens are against this war. That's right. Because this is not America's war. That's right. And should not be. Yeah. I'm here to ask you to pray for peace, but also to pick up the phone and call your representatives yes. and tell them uh, that you are not in favor. And it helps. It works, believe me. We had the opportunity to meet with a couple of uh, uh, Northern Jersey members of the Congress, mm -hmm. and we made our opinions known to them, and we believe it worked. Mm -hmm. It gave them the other side of right. the story, because they right. listened to people who are pushing right. America to mm -hmm. go to war. But when we talked to them, they were able to find the, to see the other side of the coin also. Mm -hmm. So please do that. That's, that's a moral obligation of all of us to do it. Not just because we want to save Syria, but because we want to save the United States of America. You know, these people, these Islamist fighters are not going to stay within Syrian borders. They're going out 
They are already fighting with the other part of the opposition, the armed opposition, the so-called three Free Syrian army, they are fighting among each other because they want to impose their Sharia, Sharia law on everybody. I cannot forget the plight of two of our prominent archbishops, the mm. two Orthodox archbishops of Aleppo, Mar Gregorius Johanna Ibrahim, who came here to, to Princeton yep. for, for a conference about yep. Syria several yep. times, yep. more than yep. once. Yep. And the other archbishop, Boulos Yaziji, both of them of Aleppo, they were on a mission to save some people, to bring back people who were kidnapped by these Muslim fanatics. They went to bring some priests who were kidnapped, and they themselves got kidnapped on the way back. Since April 22nd, we do not have news about them. We know nothing about them. Everybody tells us different things. Even the United States of America, the State Department are not telling us any information. They say we know they are alive, but we cannot say more than that. What message is that to Christians in Syria? When I say Christians in Syria, I, say, I talk about Christians in the Middle East in general. Mm. Christianity did not start in Europe, not, mm. not even in Rome. It started in Jerusalem, yeah. in Damascus, yeah. in Surah and Tyre and That's Saida, right. That's right. where Jesus the Lord walked and preached. Let me tell you a story. When I first came to the United States of America, I was flying to go and visit one of our parishes, and I was wearing my cler clerical suit without this outer garb. I was so gentleman was sitting next to me, and he looked at me and he said, "Are you a priest?" I said, "Yes, I am a priest." What church? I told him, Syrian Orthodox. From where? I told him from Syria. Oh, are the Christians in Syria? I said, "Yes, there are." <laughs> and then he said, "Well, when did you convert?" <laughs> he asked me, "When did I convert?" I told him, I really don't remember. I took it very seriously. I said, I don't remember, but it must have been some 2,000 years ago. <laughs> and he looked at me. I told him, no, Christianity started in Syria. That's right. In the Middle East, That's in Jerusalem, right. in Bethlehem. That's right. But very soon, if this trend continues, Christians will not remain in Syria, neither in the Middle East. Look what's happening in Egypt. 80, some 80 churches were attacked. Some of them were destroyed totally. Lebanon, how many Christians left Lebanon? Iraq, we went there. The Americans went to Iraq in 2003 to topple Saddam. Saddam was taking care of Christians. I'm not a fond of Saddam, of what he mm. did. Mm. But Christians live relatively in peace under Saddam. We brought him down. Since then, more than one and a half million, almost 1.2, 1.3 million Christians left Iraq. Mm. Out of 1.5 million, about 250 to 300 only remain in Iraq today. And that was their homeland for 2,000, for more than 2,000, because they were there before Christianity even. Syria is going to see the same thing. Christians are leaving Syria. Christians are driven out. The kidnap of the two archbishops is a message to the rest of Christians that you are not welcome here. And we know what's going to happen. I am telling you, we know we, you are going to hear it if, God forbid, that happens. They are going to give us three options, either to convert or to pay hefty tax, jizya, which many people cannot pay, therefore they have to convert, or to be killed. The other option is leave. Now, this has not been the case in Syria for the many past years, especially under this, the Assad regime, the father and the son. Christians were treated very yes, well. Yes. In many ways, and I can say it honestly, with truthfully, in many ways, you were treated better than our uh, brothers and sisters, the Muslims. Muslims looked up to us for many things, for leadership in terms of, of culture, of education, of enlightenment. All that is going to be gone, and that is a big loss for Syria, for the Muslims of Syria. If they leave us alone, the Syrians will find a way to live together peacefully and to have peace. If the foreign intervention is stopped, Syria will come back alive and healthy. Amen. Please, please, tell your Congress people, President Obama, not to go and bomb Syria. Amen. It will not serve anybody's interest. Amen. Do not serve the United States' interest, neither the Syrian people's interest. 
I thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. I was so grateful. We have to pray. I mean, there's no way we can do it without the prayer. And um, and also the only option, basically, is to turn to our our God and say, show us the way. 3,000 years ago, Hosea said, uh, that we need to beat our swords into plowshares and our swords into pruning hooks. They were showing us the way that this war is just not the answer. Amen. And we also, he said, and I thought this was very interesting, that he says that there should be war no more. And it said, for all the people will walk, everyone, in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Now this is Hosea, 3,000 years ago. Mary Baker Eddy, who was the discoverer and founder of Christian Science, as always said, there will be war no more, and she takes everything from the Bible. And she has a prayer that I'd like to share with you, and that we can all join in, basically, in holy and thought, that one infinite God good unifies men and nations, constitutes the brotherhood of man, ends wars, fulfills the scripture, love thy neighbor as thyself, annihilates pagan and Christian idolatry, whatever is wrong in social, civil, criminal, political, and religious codes, equalizes the sexes, annuls the curse on man, and leaves nothing that can sin, suffer, be punished, or destroyed. God is all in all. Maybe we can have a few moments of silent prayer for all of us. Amen. Amen. Okay. Where do you want it to be? Is that right? We are represented here by leaders in many faith groups. I'd like to, while all of us are not going to be speaking from all of the faith traditions, uh, what the speakers have referred to today speaks to common civil rights mm -hmm. in this is special year in the United States. It speaks to our common human rights in this world. It speaks for Muslims, for Jews, Zoroastrians, Baha'i, for the whole panoply mm. of faith traditions in our world. Uh, Dr. Hamad, I thank you for introducing yourself to me. I'm sorry we don't have time today. Uh, uh, please keep in your hearts that the words that were spoken here in, the, in respect to people's and groups' human rights refers to us all. Mm -hmm. Because we are all Muslims, we are all Christians, we are all Jews, we are all representatives together of one humanity. Yesterday I was at the United Nations for the Forum on the Culture of Peace, for Peace. And where their focus and the, the, the message I took from that yesterday, and I think it's for all of us, is for whom are we doing all of this? for the children of the world. And it's the education of a culture of peace for all children of faith or not faith, belief or non-belief, but for children and the next generations to come. That's what we should teach. And I thank you very much. All right.